written this book on uh, that. What do you make of what was going on now? Well, what's going on now is nothing to do with the business cycle. It's much, much bigger than that. We're getting a change in the structure of the way the world works. And it's very simple. In the, a market system, prices are determined by supply and demand. Uh, but that isn't always true. Uh, I know they tell you in economics and in the MBA and the CFA that supply and demand determine prices. But sometimes the government doesn't like the prices. And the government comes in to determine prices. And that's a structural change that goes on for 20, 30 years. That's what we're living through this last couple of years. And we're about to see that up oh, the Explain ante. that to me in a bit more. Are you talking specifically about Europe? Uh, no, I'm talking much broader. I'm talking about the entire developed world. Now, obviously, it's come to a head in Europe first. So in terms of what's going to happen in the next quarter, we're talking about Europe. We're talking about uh, exchange controls, limiting capital outflows. They don't like the price of bank capital, so they're going to reprice that. They're going to nationalize that. Uh, these are what I mean by governments getting into intervening in prices. But look, that's coming to the entire developed world, but it's just starting in Europe. So the focus is on Europe. But this structural change has actually been going on for a long time. This is the transfer from west to east is what you're talking about yeah, as well. Yeah, I really am. I'm saying that the, in the east there's no reason for the governments to get involved really in the markets more than they are at the minute. Mm. Uh, that they're not moving anywhere up and down this scale from, if you like, communism to free market capitalism. But in the west we're clearly taking a major major swing, structural swing, towards governments intervening in markets. Okay, well, all right, let's talk a little bit about what uh, precipitated all this. Ben Bernanke coming out and saying that uh, there were downward risks to the U.S. economy and, of course, that uh, Operation Twist coming through and just coming on really not surprising anybody. But, you know, does it just show us that uh, the Fed doesn't really have the tools to deal with what's going on? Yes, I think that is what it shows us. I mean, the reason I think the market was disappointed is usually when a central banker says things are worse than I expected, and he says, here's more medicine. Bernanke said, things are worse than I expected, and there's no more medicine. In other words, the central bank's balance sheet's not expanding. That's the thing about Operation Twist. It's a technical movement within the balance sheet, but it's not QE1 or QE2. The balance sheet's not expanding. So that's what people But is thought. there room for another round of that? No. QE3? There isn't. In theory, Central bank balance sheets can expand to infinity. Ask Robert Mugabe about how far you can extend the balance sheet of a central bank. Well, you know what happened with inflation there. Exactly. But in practice, that's why central banks stop at some stage. And I believe this central bank, in terms of extending the balance sheet, it has stopped. And it doesn't need to extend the balance sheet anyway. There's no point in creating more bank reserves in America. The point is to get the banks working. But unfortunately, if you look at the share price of, say, well, banks... that was the whole idea of having the Fed and the open window that they had, which was designed to actually unclog those credit markets. Well, that's, that's what I was going to say. The problem is they haven't un unclogged the banking system. So there's no point in creating more bank reserves. There's plenty of bank reserves in the system. Get the banking system working. That's the important thing now. Uh, they're not succeeding in that. I mean, maybe they'll succeed in due course. But when the share price of Bank America does what it does, it's telling you that that banking system isn't going to start working soon. All right. Well, you know, what about Europe? We've got the same sort of issue there, too, haven't we? But uh, overall, it's a sovereign one as well. I mean, with, of course, Greece, we're weighing on everything. Where do we go? Uh, well, I think certainly before Christmas, we'll nationalize quite a few of the European banks. Uh, it's the European way. You know, people in our business think... Well, certainly in Britain we have, haven't we? Yeah, sure. People think in our business, they own the whole markets, dictate prices, and governments respond to the price. Sometimes the governments just don't like the price. So I think the, the, the clear manifestation, practical one for investors, is that they'll nationalize some banks before Christmas. You know, where do we go with this? I mean, how low can uh, these valuations go now? Okay, well, there's two different markets here. There's the West and there's the East. Uh, now, in terms of the West, equities look very cheap because, uh, you know... They're cheap for a good reason, is what you well, said. Well, as they're well. cheap if the earnings hold up, but the earnings won't hold up. I mean, if you look at the United States of America, corporate profits as a percentage of GDP are at an all-time high. I say all-time high. I have the data to 1950. They've never been higher. So they're clearly going to come down. So there's an illusion that the valuations are cheap uh, in, in the United States. However, in Asia, I don't think that earnings are going to come off dramatically. I don't think that we're looking at a, a major structural downturn for earnings. We're looking at a cyclical downturn for earnings. So at some stage, perhaps in the next six to nine months, Asian equities will be genuinely cheap. Uh, but I think in America and, and Europe, it's going to be quite a bit longer before they get cheap. So when we see a massive sell-off, as we've seen in, uh, on Wall Street and indeed, let's say, in London and uh, elsewhere in Europe, that will not necessarily then be taking its toll on Asian equity markets? Uh, well, it will in the short run. But what we have to remember is that we've, I mean, we've discussed how the central bank in, in, in the Europe and the developed world may be limited, how the government may be limited in its responses. But out here in Asia, governments have got huge responses and central bankers have huge responses if they want to use them. So, for instance, in India, I think well, I'll ask a simple question to your viewers. Would you buy Indian equities if interest rates in India were 1%? Everybody says yes. Well, if necessary, 
that can happen. It, can, you can, it can't uh, happen in the West. But then having said that, if you're talking about India specifically, you could put your money into a bank there and get 10%. I, uh, I recommend you do that. And, and, but I mean, then you get currency exposure. Yeah, well, that's I, I recommend you do that. I recommend you get your money into the Asian currencies. I know the last couple of weeks has been bad and they're falling pretty rapidly. But it's a much, much, much better bet than having your money in the developed world currencies. So, right. So how does it all end when we look at Europe? I mean, you talked about banks being nationalized before the break. And you know how important is this for there to be clarity so that investors can actually then have some sort of, uh, well, they hate uncertainty, don't they? So they have some certainty. Yeah, it's a strange thing. I mean, here, here the global capitalist system, we're about to nationalize the banks and investors will probably like it because it brings certainty. It's a bizarre situation. It's a very, very negative long-term thing for Europe when they do this. But speaking to many of the investors at the CLSA Economic Forum, particularly those based in Asia, they're so convinced that the euro is going to collapse that when, the, when it doesn't collapse and it won't collapse, the markets will probably go up. But fundamentally, this is, you know, as I said, a major structural turning point, a bad thing for returning capital in Europe. The Asian markets in the short run might quite like it because because they're, they're looking at something even worse, which is the collapse of Euro. It's a doomsday scenario, essentially. Yeah, people say it's deflation, devaluation, default. No, it's not. It's nationalization. So in a bizarre world, people like nationalization because they, they think it's going to be the other three. All right. And uh, the states? Uh, the States is not in the same position Europe is yet because the government of America can borrow at an incredibly cheap interest rate. 